So peer support has become a new thing in the journalist workplace. There are a number of news organisations, ABC News in Australia, BBC, Reuters, who have their own kind of peer support programmes. The kind of guiding principle about, behind these schemes is the same, and that's that the journalists are often reluctant to talk to outside professionals. Uh, and actually, a lot of the time when they're experiencing difficulty in working around issues to do with trauma, they don't need to see outside professionals, they don't need to see clinicians. What would be particularly useful is having the opportunity to share concerns with other colleagues who understand the work in detail um, and can provide them with a, a kind of basic level of support. So the kind of support we're talking about is really about being a good buddy. It's not about diagnosing somebody. It's not about giving them particularly sophisticated psychological information. It's just about being a good mensch and looking out for a colleague. So when people get into difficulty, what often happens is they contract into themselves and they start to withdraw and become isolated, may even become a little bit suspicious of the people around them. So anything that can act as a kind of human bridge and help to reconnect people back into work, back into the community of journalists that they're working with, is likely to be helpful. So there will be times, perhaps, when journalists need to access support. And one way of looking at this is to think about the problem as a three-legged stool. So there's some reporters who might um, just go straight to managers and say, I'm having a hard time, um, I may need some help. There may be others, though, who wouldn't want to do that because they, they're worried about their jobs. They might uh, phone up the EAP, the Employment Assistance Provider, if the organisation has one. In other words, a kind of confidential helpline. But again, people often don't trust those. And the kind of third leg of the tripod is reaching out to colleagues. And this is one of the places where a good peer support scheme comes into play. So there are a number of things that um, a peer supporter can do. One is they can normalise distress reactions, help give a context for what their colleague is experiencing. They can also be a helpful conduit for information about trauma and mental health, including basic self-care messages. They may also be able to facilitate some more technical mentoring. It could be that a journalist is struggling with an aspect of the work or a moral or ethical dilemma, and a conversation around that can be really helpful. And the last thing that they can do is that they can catch people before they get into more serious trouble. So what a good peer supporter is trying to do is to help their colleague brainstorm a bit. So most people know what they need, but they often kind of lose connection to it when they're stressed or, or challenged. A peer supporter isn't trying to fix somebody or solve all their problems. They're just trying to give, just trying to put a little bit more stability back under somebody and help them work out their problems for themselves. So the Dart Centre has helped a number of organisations set up their peer support schemes. And one of the great things about it is that people are very enthusiastic. There are always you know, volunteers who want to you know, help their colleagues. But the, the difficulty is, is that people often feel a little bit ill-equipped to do that. They're not quite sure how to start a conversation with somebody who's struggling. They may worry that uh, they're being intrusive, and that you know, they don't have the right to kind of make contact and reach out. So the underlying principle behind a peer support scheme is that it's something that's run for journalists and by journalists. Um, in setting up a scheme, a company is probably going to need to engage somebody with um, professional expertise, so outside clinicians or psychologists. There are also times in which it might be necessary to refer journalists who are in trouble onto a clinical specialist. When we're dealing with trauma, by the way, that psychologist needs to be a trauma-focused specialist, not a general psychologist, not an occupational psychologist, nor a general therapist, but somebody who has specific knowledge and experience of working with people who've been impacted by trauma. Another important role that outside professionals can play is in help is in helping to train and monitor the peer supporters. So there's a slight danger that if you're a peer supporter, you might start to take on the to take on some of the emotional difficulties of the people that you're um, reaching out to. So peer supporters need to be trained in basic trauma awareness. 
they need to understand what psychological first aid is and they also need to have some input on how to maintain good respectful boundaries with their colleagues, how to preserve confidentiality and also how to look after themselves. So the most important thing any news organisation can do is to create a trauma-informed news culture. And so that means uh, creating a space where journalists are aware of what traumatic stress reactions are and also of what they aren't. People often get distressed by their distress because they don't understand that necessarily the, the kinds of distress they're experiencing may be nothing to worry about. Um, so in other words, putting a kind of proper framing around trauma reactions and what they are and what it takes to look after oneself. It's also important that a news organisation thinks about how it tells these stories. In other words, um, does what it can do to develop the craft capacity for journalists to work effectively on difficult stories. Um, it's very important that journalists have a good understanding of what it takes to interview trauma-affected survivors in a way that's sensitive. So it's about taking trauma seriously and understanding what it is and what it isn't and how it fits into the professional world of the journalist.